I learned this from my idol, professor, and dean, Dean Celedonio Chongson, who was my first professor in the field of political science in law when I was only barely 16 years old as a first-year first student in the College of Business and Arts and Sciences at the University of the East. Before I start the ball rolling, let me introduce myself. I am Dean Jo Santos Palagtas Biscera. I have a Bachelor of Business Administration, major in accounting, and a certified public accountant from the University of the East, summa cum laude. I went to the University of the Philippines to have my Master of Business Administration degree, MBA, uh, in Diliman, University of the Philippines, graduating as magna cum laude and valedictorian. I finished my law degree at the University of the East, cum laude and valedictorian. After I finished my collegiate degree in accounting, I immediately went into the corporate world to join some of the big companies in the field of finance and accounting to include among others uh, Fuji Xerox, Motorola, Esso Petron, Glaxo Smithkline, Meralco's Construction Division, Eco Asia, Delgado Brothers, Furadan, and I did a consulting stint on two projects with the International Bank of Reconstruction and Development or the World Bank. After I passed the bar examination as a working student, I engaged myself in the active practice of law appearing in the trial courts of Metro Manila and the, suburb, uh, the, the surrounding provinces, even if I had to take a leave from the office on uh, vacation leave. And because of my active practice in law plus my involvement in the teaching of law, I was lucky to have been nominated on two occasions as Associate Justice of the Supreme Court. I am also active as a professor, uh, professorial lecturer in criminal law and mercantile law with the Philippine Judicial Academy, the training arm of the Supreme Court. Today, I am the incumbent Dean of the College of Law of the University of Manila and concurrently also its Vice President for Legal Services, a bar reviewer and a law professor. At one time, I also occupied the same position with the University of Perpetual Help in Las Piñas and Binyan. For 35 years, I was uh, a professorial lecturer with expertise in financial management at the De La Salle University and also the University of the Philippines in Diliman and the University of the East. For a number of years, I was bar reviewer and law professor not only at the University of Manila but also at the University of the East, University of Santo Tomas, De La Salle University, the University of Perpetual Health, San Sebastian College and Far Eastern University. This particular sharing that I have with you on conflict of laws, which used to be called public private international law, is dedicated to the professor from whom I learned this and the one who introduced to me what is the field of law. This is with fond memories of Dean Celedonio Chongson of the University of the East. So without much ado, let us now start our sharing uh, as part of the University of Manila Bar Review and also the regular lessons online for our law students. The coverage of conflict of laws would include, among others, the following. The nature and composition of conflict rules the second one is the Philippines conflict of laws. Third would be the nationality theory. 
Fourth would be the conflict of laws affecting citizenship, status, capacity, paternity, and filiation. The next would be the impact of conflict of laws on marriage and divorce. The aspect of real and personal properties as it interfaces with conflict of laws. The effect of conflict of laws on wills and succession. The domiciliary theory, which is in contrast with the nationality theory. And finally, the most interesting topic for law professors and bar reviewers and reviewers, the problem of the Renvoa or the Renvoa doctrine. To start with, what is the concept and nature of conflict of laws? Conflict of laws refers to a state's municipal or domestic law that directs its courts and administrative agencies to apply or not to apply a foreign law in resolving a legal problem involving a foreign element. Very interesting. When we speak about the conflict of law, we are referring to a municipal law, a Philippine law, or a set of laws that would allow our courts and administrative agencies to invoke foreign law because there is an alien or foreigner involved in the dispute. Another way to look at it is that the conflict of laws is a collection of domestic laws, and that is true here in our sharing. We will show you five of them that directs the courts and administrative agencies to adopt a foreign law or foreign laws in resolving a legal problem with a foreign element. The foreign element may be a person or it may be a foreign place. So what are the elements of conflict of laws? Number one. The state has a municipal law or a set of laws concerning the use of foreign law in domestic cases with a foreign element. So it's a local case presented before a judicial court and a foreigner is part of the case. He's either a complainant or a defendant or respondent. Second element of the topic of conflict of laws is that the said law or laws directs the courts and administrative agencies on when to use foreign law because it's fundamental that the local courts would use Philippine law. However, there will be instances when by reason of our uh, provisions on conflict of laws, our courts are guided on when to use a foreign law or a set of foreign laws to resolve an issue because a foreigner is involved. Third, the legal problem at hand involves a foreign element, either a person or a place. And finally, either foreign law or Philippine domestic law is available to resolve the problem. In other words, there are available Philippine laws but because there is a foreigner involved or there is a foreign place involved, then the uh, conflict law of the country allows us to see whether a foreign law can be invoked by Philippine courts. And so let us take a look now into what is in our Philippine domestic law representing our conflicts law. The first one is under Article 15 of the Civil Code, which created the nationality theory in so far as the Philippines is concerned in handling with our countrymen and in dealing with, a ca with cases involving foreign elements. 
under Article 15, of which manifests our nationality theory adherence, is that laws pertaining to family rights and duties or to the status, condition, and legal capacity of persons are binding upon citizens of the Philippines even though living abroad. In the most fundamental uh, essence, a Filipino citizen, insofar as status and legal capacity or condition is concerned, carries with him Philippine law, whether he is living and staying in the Philippines, or he has gone to the United States, he has gone to Europe, he has gone to other foreign countries. Likewise, the laws relating to family rights and duties would be governed by Philippine law. The second uh, conflict of laws provision in our uh, domestic law is contained also in Article 16, second paragraph of the Civil Code, which says that interstate and documentary and testamentary successions both with respect to the order of succession and to the amount of successional rights and to the intrinsic validity of testamentary provisions shall be regulated by the national law of the person whose succession is under consideration, whatever may be the nature of the property and regardless of the country wherein said property may be found. Now, the law on succession is also following the nationality theory. So that if a Filipino is the dead person, then his inher the inheritance of his properties, meaning the order of succession, in other words, who will inherit his property, the amount of successional rights, how much will each uh, heir get, and then whatever provisions were made in the last will and testament, the intrinsic validity will depend upon Philippine law. And this is the family code. However, very interesting is, if the deceased person is an alien or a foreigner, then the order of his inheritance, the, the people who will inherit from him, the amount of the, uh, what will be inherited by these heirs, and the validity of his uh, last will and testament will not depend upon Philippine law. Using the nationality theory, it will depend upon the national law where he comes from. The third uh, component of conflict of laws under Philippine law is under Article 17, third paragraph, which says, Prohibitive laws concerning persons, their acts or property, and those which have for their object public order, public policy, and good customs shall not be rendered ineffective by laws or judgments promulgated by or by determinations or conventions agreed upon in a foreign country. Take note of this. The laws that we have, Philippine laws, that do not allow persons to act, to do per certain acts, or to use their property, or those laws whose objects are to maintain public order, public policy, and good customs, will continue to be binding upon Filipinos wherever they may be in the entire world, regardless of what a foreign country, including that country where they are staying, is saying. In so far as the Filipino is concerned, he will be bound by Philippine law when this Philippine law does not allow him to perform any act or to use his property even when that is allowed under the law where he is staying. Provided he is a Filipino, he is bound by the laws called prohibitive laws insofar as his person, his acts, or his property are concerned. Or whether such acts are, uh, whether such laws were enacted in order to maintain public order, 
public policy and good customs. The fourth uh, component of Philippine Conflicts Law is under Article 17, first paragraph, which says that the forms and solemnities of contracts, wills, and other public instruments shall be governed by the laws of the country in which they are executed. This principle under Article 17, first paragraph is called Lex Loci Celebrationis. So that if a particular document, a particular contract, a specific will, or other public documents, meaning notarized documents, would not be anymore validated in the Philippines if they were already validly executed by reason of the laws of the country where they were made. And we will illustrate in a little while that if we follow this particular principle strictly, then the issue is what happens if under Lex Loci Celebrationis, a contract, a document executed and validly recognized in a foreign country would run contrary to the substantive law in the Philippines. And so while the contract is supposed to be have been validly executed, would it have its legal effect in the Philippines if it is contrary to Philippine law? We will go into that in a very interesting manner. Another component of the Philippine Conflicts Law is in under, under, under Article 16, which has been termed as the Lex Situs. It says, real property as well as personal property is subject to the law of the country where it is stipulated. So in so far as Philippine law is concerned, real property and personal property shall be governed by the law of the country where it is stipulated. The word stipulation originally I, uh, was thought to be uh, uh, situated, but no. When we say we stipulate, we agree, we have provided. And so the property, whether real or personal, has been legally provided to be situated in a certain uh, country. Then those properties will be governed by the law of the country where they are stipulated. Going now to the nationality theory. In the conflict of laws concept of the na of nationality theory, the state determines the status and capacity of an individual. It is his own state that will determine whether he's single or married or whether he's a citizen or not based on the law of the individual's nationality. And we will see that in a little while that Whenever we raise the question on citizenship, we raise the question on whether or not a person is married or single. We raise the issue on whether uh, a person is validly divorced. We raise the question on whether he owns property. All of these are resolved using the nationality theory which says that these are to be contended with in the context of Philippine domestic law, if the person concerned is a Filipino citizen. However, if the person concerned is an alien or a foreigner, then using the same nationality theory, the resolution of, this is, of the status, capacity, and all similar issues concerning him under the nationality theory will have to be resolved using the law of his country. The Philippines, as we have seen in the five uh, uh, components of the conflicts of laws, adheres to the nationality theory. And to reiterate, under Article 15, when we speak about family rights and duties, when you speak about a person's status, condition, and legal capacity, that every citizen of the Philippines carries with him whatever is his status or legal capacity, whatever is family rights and duties under Philippine law, regardless of whether or not 
he is domiciled or living in any other country in the world. He carries with him the family rights and duties under Philippine law and he has his personal status, condition, and legal capacity under Philippine law. In the area of succession, in the matter of who inherits his property should, some, should he pass away, under Article 16, again recognizing the nationality theory, sorry, Philippine law provides that in interstate or testamentary succession, three components are defined. The order of succession, the amount of successional rights, and the intrinsic validity of testamentary provisions are regulated by the national law of the person whose succession is under consideration. Whatever may be the nature of the property and regardless of the country, wherein said property may be found. So to simplify, if a Filipino should die, whether he has a last will of testament, meaning testamentary, or whether he dies without uh, any last will of testament, interstate succession, will decide, Philippine uh, law on succession will decide on who will inherit his property, how much will they receive, as heirs, and if there are any provisions on the disposition of the free portion in the last will and testament, the intrinsic validity of such uh, provisions in the last will and testament shall be governed by Philippine law, the law of the Filipino who passed away. Now watch out for this. If, since we are talking about uh, the presence of an alien or a foreigner, before the court. And so if it is a foreigner who is in court or his estate is in court because he passed away, then the order of his succession, the amount of how much his heirs will receive and whatever uh, testamentary provision he has put there will be governed by the national law of that deceased foreigner. And so that therefore it is not Philippine law following the nationality theory that will be uh, followed in so far as the order of succession, the amount of successional right, or the intrinsic validity of any last will and testament is using the national law of the, of the alien who is the subject matter. And so this is... These are the three most important components of the nationality theory that is being summarized in this slide. We probably now wonder, if our Philippine courts are given the guideline to follow foreign law, uh, like if we decide on how to dispose of the property of a person who is an alien, but there's properties in the Philippines. The nationality theory says that you follow the law of that particular alien in disposing of his property before Philippine courts. The big question mark is, if we invoke the foreign law before Philippine courts, is there an occasion where the foreign law is in direct conflict with Philippine law? Let us revisit that. First, in the area of citizenship. If a Filipino is to be resolved to be a Filipino citizen, obviously what will be used is his national law, which is Philippine law. And Philippine law under our constitution follows the principle of use sanguinis, citizenship by blood. On the other hand, we recognize that if we are to invoke U.S. law on citizenship, then U.S. law follows the principle of use solely on citizenship by place of birth. So here, a person who qualifies as a Filipino citizen 
may in fact be also qualified to be an American citizen because his entry into Philippine citizenship decided under our constitution follows the use sanguinis principle. However, that person, even if he's Filipino by use sanguinis, can still qualify if he were born in the United States. This is precisely the very essence of the case of Gabby Lopez during the hearing on the ABS-CBN franchise, which touched on the issue on whether ABS-CBN, a mass media organization which requires 100% Filipino citizenship, the citizenship of Gabby Lopez was raised. And we will revisit that when uh, in the, the following slides. Second possible conflict is in marriage. While it is true that in the Philippines we recognize monogamy, one husband, one wife. In other countries like Saudi Arabia, one husband may be more than one wife because they uh, recognize polygamy legally as part of their system considering they are uh, Muslim countries. Third one, very interesting, is foreign laws may allow the marriage which are not allowed under Philippine law, notably the family code. For example, in the Philippines, we do not allow the marriage uh, of two or more persons with one partner. So a husband can only be one husband to a one wife. It cannot be a one husband to two married wives, marrying two wives, where he will now be uh, committing the criminal offense of bigamy. However, because the Muslim countries recognize polygamy, in Libya, a man can have more than one legal wife. He can have two wives, three wives under, and four wives under Muslim law. Second, in the Philippines, a particular person may be ruled not fit for marriage because that person is suffering from psychological incapacity. But in South Korea, uh, the psychological incapacity in the Philippines does not only result into annulment of marriage. In South Korea, uh, psychological incapacity, including all other grounds, lead to a divorce rather than simply an annulment of marriage. So you can see the foreign law governing South Korea on marriage relationship on psychological incapacity differs. That the foreign law in South Korea allows divorce to creep in when there is psychological incapacity. But in the Philippines, there is no divorce. The psychological incapacity allows a retroaction of the ceremony of the marriage to determine whether there was already psychological incapacity at the very start that could not have allowed the marriage to prosper. Also, in other countries like Pakistan, a father can marry a daughter. But in the Philippines, obviously, a father cannot marry a daughter. Ascendants and descendants cannot marry each other, and brothers and sisters could not marry each other. Such particular marriage of members of the uh, family are called incestuous marriages, and that is not allowed under Philippine law. Now, Similar to that are collater marriages of collateral relatives. Like in Iran, a father can marry an, his adopted daughter. And these collateral relatives now includes, for example, the father-in-law, the adopting father parent, uh, the children of the adopter and the adopter, and all of these prov pro provided for in the family code. In the Philippines, it's a long list of collateral relatives who could not marry each other. In other countries, notably Iran, this can happen. And finally, in the Philippines, a prohibited marriage is 
by one of the uh, uh, contracting parties to be a minor less than 18 years old. A, a, uh, a child of 18 years old, of less than 18 years old, cannot, cannot contract marriage in the Philippines. But a child who is uh, 15 years old or more in Bangladesh can contract marriage. Well, very famous expectation here in the sharing in France and Spain. A man and a man can get married because same-sex marriages are legalized. The Philippines cannot and does not recognize same-sex marriages. Number five, marriage after death. Would you believe in France if your girlfriend should die? And the girlfriend is some is one that the boyfriend loves so much. The boyfriend can get into a posthumous marriage, which is a marriage between a living person and a dead sweetheart. It is also true if it is the the the, the, the boyfriend who passed away, the girlfriend may decide to still marry him even if he is already a deceased body. In the Philippines, we do not have such. Anything that is close to death in order to allow marriage is what is called marriage articulo mortis, where the formalities of marriages, like a marriage license, may be dispensed with because one of the contracting parties may be in imminent danger of dying. But at the time of death, in marriage articulo mortis, both parties continue to still be alive at the time they entered into the marriage contract. Number six, divorce. Obviously, we know that Japan and all other countries allow divorce in their own country. In the whole uh, uh, world, in so far as the United Nations uh, countries are concerned, only the Philippines and Vatican have no divorce laws in their respective countries. And finally, in the way of last will and testament, do you know that in Switzerland, an oral will, a verbal will, is allowed provided the requisite witnesses are present. In the Philippines, a last will and testament should always be in writing. So in these seven examples you can see even when foreign law can be invoked in resolving a case before a Philippine court, this foreign law may in fact be running in conflict with Philippine law. For example, in marriage, if a Filipina uh, goes to court to sue for support his uh, her, her husband in Libya. In Libya, the Filipina is the number two wife, legal wife, because they are allowed polygamy. But because the polygamous marriage is not recognized in, uh, is recognized in only in Libya, but not in the Philippines, there will be an issue on whether or not that particular Filipina filing a case of support against the Libyan husband under Philippine law can succeed in securing that support. Because under Philippine law, which does not allow bigamy, that's number two uh, Libyan wife, uh, number two wife of the Libyan, the Filipina, is not under Philippine law recognized as a legitimate In the same situation, for example, in the incestuous marriages, if you have a Filipina whose mother is a Pakistani, and the Pakistani father decides to marry the Filipina, the half-Filipina, half-Pakistani uh, daughter, would that particular half-Filipina, half-Pakistani daughter 
be considered, you know, married under Philippine law to that Pakistani father. Considering in Philippine law, the marriage between the Pakistani father and the half Filipina, half Pakistani daughter is void for being incestuous. See, very, very interesting. Now, also going to the area of minors marrying at less than 18 is void in the Philippines. But in, in Bangladesh, that Philippi, uh, 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 the girl may be married if more than 15 years old. So what happens now, if a Bangladesh father marries a Filipina, and the Filipina girl, the, 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 the offspring is half Filipina, half Bangladeshi. And the, at the age of 16, she got married to another Bangladeshi. The question would be, would that particular half Filipina be considered legally married before Philippine courts? If you were to fill up a form on whether or not her legal status, the question would be, is she married or single? And so these are some of the very interesting uh, statics that can confront us before Philippine courts when we try to invoke foreign law in deciding a case involving an alien. Going now into the nationality theory applied on citizenship. Take note that under Article 15, the laws relating to the person's status and legal capacity and citizenship is a legal capacity are binding upon citizens of the Philippines even though living abroad. It is now again an opportunity for us to revisit the very interesting uh, battleground in the House of Representatives insofar as the citizenship of Gabby Lopez is concerned. Let us revisit the facts of that case. You have a couple, Eugenio Lopez Jr. and Chita Lopez, both Filipino citizens. Sometime in the 1950s, they went into the United States, most particularly in Boston, Massachusetts, and in the process, Chita gave birth to a son, Gabby. So Gabby is the son of a Filipino father and a Filipino mother and born in the United States of America. And precisely under the concept of conflict of laws, it says our courts and administrative agencies. And so we would like to believe that the House of Representatives is a proper forum somehow to consider whether or not Gabby uh, Lopez is a Filipino citizen. And the principle in conflict of laws is that Gabby Lopez, being born of a Filipino father and even a Filipino mother, will be, con will be evaluated in so far as his status and legal capacity is concerned under Philippine law. However, because he was born in the United States, his birth in a foreign land brings about the foreign element in so far as citizenship is concerned. And so in the conflicts rule, under Article 15, which is to be used by the Philippines, we now revisit which says that our constitution provided you sanguinis which says that if your father is a Filipino citizen, then you are a Filipino citizen. Under that score, Eugenio Lopez Jr., the father, is a Filipino citizen. That means Gabby Lopez is Filipino citizen under Philippine law following Article 15 on the conflicts rules. Actually, if you go back to another provision of the Constitution, Gabby Lopez's mother is also Filipino, and so therefore, he also acquires Filipino citizenship in an independent mode from his mother. 
Conceptually, we do not call him double Filipino. We simply call him a Filipino. And here, his uh, affiliation with his father is already sufficient to establish him as Filipino. Now, here is where the interesting conflict of laws come in. While we're following the nationality theory and therefore applying Eusanguinis uh, to consider that Gabi Lopez is Filipino, if he were to be uh, considered under American law, American law follows the use solely principle in recognizing citizenship. And here it is the place of birth that becomes the guiding principle on the nationality of uh, a person under American law. And so since Gabby Lopez was born in Boston, Massachusetts in the USA, under American law, an American court can decide that he is also an American citizen. Here is a situation where he moves into the status of a person possessing dual citizenship, one Filipino, one U.S. However, under before our courts, in invoking the conflict of laws, the Philippine courts will have no choice except to use Philippine law, the Philippine Constitution, by reason of Article 15, which recognizes the nationality theory in identifying the status and legal capacity of a person. Ergo, insofar as the concept and the question before the House of Representatives is concerned, Gabi Lopez, strictly under Philippine law, is a Filipino citizen. As to whether he's an American citizen is irrelevant because what is being asked in the issue of uh, Filipino ownership in mass media is whether or not the shareholders are Filipinos. And if Gabi Lopez is there as a shareholder and he is Filipino, he does not make ABS-CBN a non-Filipino, regardless of what the American courts will rule in so far as he is concerned. American courts have no jurisdiction over the issues that are uh, within the structure of Philippine uh, legal system. Here is a variation. What if there are two Americans? This time, let's change the scenario altogether. And you have two Americans, a uh, husband and a wife called Jack and Jill. And Jack and Jill decided to come to Manila. And while uh, both of them were in Manila, Jill, the mother, gave birth to a son, Jackie, in Manila. And so you have now, from the point that if the question is whether or not, what is the citizenship of son, Jackie? Remember, the resolution of the personal status and legal capacity of the son would depend upon his country of origin. And that therefore, there will be a beautiful question on what is his country of origin under the nationality theory. In effect, we're saying we will resolve your, your citizenship based on the nationality theory of your country. So moving on, the conflict issue would be if we use Philippine law to evaluate Jackie and invoke Eusanguinis, Eusanguinis will allow him to be identified as carrying the blood of an American. And so under Philippine law, uh, on national, uh, under Philippine law respecting nationality theory, using so Eusanguinis, his father is American, and therefore he is American. And by reason of the national theory of the Philippines, his citizenship is non-Filipino. In so far as we are concerned, we do not conclude he is American. We can only say he is non-Filipino 
because he does not meet the requirement that uh, he is a Filipino citizen by Yu Sanguinis. Because Yu Sanguinis would have demanded that his father is Filipino. And his father is not Filipino but American and therefore he cannot be a Filipino citizen by Yu Sanguinis. Now, assuming for the sake of argument that the U.S. is now confronted, the U.S. courts are now confronted with the citizenship of Jackie. And while we are not in authority to judge the US, how the U.S. courts would make their judgment, we are aware that the conflicts rule says that for, for a person to be considered a U.S. citizen, he becomes a U.S. citizen if he were one born in the United States under the principle of usually. The question is, where was Jackie born? Manila. And is Manila part of the United States? The answer is no. And so that therefore, under the principle of usually, which the United States is following, can Jackie also claim American citizenship. Let's take a look. In the final analysis, while we said Jackie cannot be a Filipino citizen under Yusanguinis because his father is non-Filipino, under American law, he may not also be able to claim he is an American citizen because he was born in Manila and not in the United States. Conclusion, Jackie is a non-Filipino and also a non-American. And so we can see an example of a person who can uh, evolve to be a stateless person. Moving now to marriage and divorce. The relevant pr uh, principle under uh, conflict of laws here is the Lex Loci Celebrationis. And Lex Loci Celebrationis says that the forms and solemnities of contracts, wills, and other public instruments shall be governed by the laws of the country in which they are executed. So wherever the contracts, wills, and public instruments are done, then it is the law of the country that governs whether they are valid instruments. Continuing, all marriages solemnized outside of the Philippines in accordance with the laws enforced in the country where they were solemnized and valid there as such shall also be valid in this country. And so while marriages uh, in the Philippines follow uh, the requirements of formalities, if a Filipino and a Filipina should get married in the United States, and the ceremony of marriage in the United States were strictly followed and solemnized, then they would be considered as married even before Philippine law because their marriage was undertaken following the law of the country where their marriage was solemnized. In the same way, a Filipino and a Filipina went into Hong Kong and got married before the Hong Kong authorities following the same rules. Will their marriage contract done in uh, Hong Kong, uh, which is valid in Hong Kong, be recognized as valid in the Philippines? Conceptually, the answer is again, yes. The same is true with marriages between a Filipino and an alien or foreigner that if they were married, for example, in Germany, or they were married in the United States or Japan, if the marriages in these countries were solemnized following the law of those countries on marriage, then the resultant marriage contract will be recognized as valid in the Philippines under the principle of Lex Loci Celebrationis. But you can understand now that there can be a lot of con there can be opportunities for conflict between Lex Loci Celebrationis versus the nationality theory of the Philippines. Let us take a look. In the following uh, illustrations, 
we now compare the nationality theory versus the impact of Lex Loci Celebrationis with the understanding that the nationality theory determines the Filipinos' standing and legal capacity and therefore the intrinsic validity of, for example, the marriage or any other undertaking. On the other hand, the Lex Loci Celebrationis recognizes the validity of the form and the solemnity, which doesn't have to conform with the solemnity and form under Philippine law. So that even if there is form and solemnity as required under Philippine law, if the uh, contract of the marriage or whatever undertaking was undertaken outside of the Philippines before foreign law, and the ceremony and form in that foreign country was followed, then under Lex Loci Celebrationis, the resulting document is also considered a valid document before Philippine law. So you can recognize now that Lex Loci Celebrationis refers to the extrinsic validity of the document evidencing the transaction and the nationality theory can deal with the intrinsic validity of the dealing. For instance, here is where the confusion can come in. In the institution of marriage, we already mentioned that there are marriages in the Philippines that are not allowed and are considered prohibited marriages under the family code, our domestic law. What happens now if, for example, the incestuous marriage, the bigamous marriage, uh, and similar marriages contracted in a foreign country valid there as such no? were to be presented as basis for legal rights and uh, condition in the Philippines. The answer is you may have some difficulty reconciling extrinsic validity from intrinsic validity. The form may be valid but the substance violates Philippine law. For example, in the area of posthumous marriage versus marriage articulum mortis. Here, one party is dead. Here, uh, both parties are not dead. And so here is now a Filipina who loved, for example, his French boyfriend so much, but the French boyfriend met a fatal accident on the road. And at the time that the Filipina girlfriend reached the hospital, the, Philipp the, the French boyfriend was already dead. But because she was really crying so hard because of her love for that French boyfriend, a person in the hospital offered that they be married even when the boyfriend is already dead. And they were married. Finally, the Filipina goes home to the Philippines. If he were to be asked, are you legally single or married? Will the posthumous marriage in France give her the status of a married person in the Philippines? More so when she is filing an income tax return. Of course, in that particular case, she is already a widow in whatever way you looked at it. But the point of the matter is, would she be able to claim that she was formerly married and therefore a widow, or she is single, considering the posthumous, posthumous French marriage has no legal standing in the Philippines? Same is true with polygamous versus monogamous marriage. The same is true with the man-to-man -man marriage, for example, in uh, Britain versus that kind of marriage not being recognized in the Philippines. Would, for example, uh, Vice Ganda and uh, Gabi uh, Concepcion decided to get married, for instance, in Belgium, same man to man. When they go back to the Philippines, would they be able to claim their legal standing as married 
considering that their marriage is a same sex marriage situation. See, that is where Lex Loci Celebrationis can conflict with nationality, nationality theory because the marriage, same man marriage, is not only legally uh, allowed, for example, in Belgium, the marriage uh, contract issued by the Belgian government under Lex Loci Celebrationis is supposedly a valid legal document. If it, is, if it were a valid legal document, can it therefore be recognized under Philippine law as valid legal document following the principle of Lex Loci Celebrationis before Philippine courts? If the answer is yes, then would Gabi uh, Concepcion and the Vice Ganda now claim in their respective rights that they're both married, even if they're married to each other. In the matter of divorce, very, very interesting. Under our nationality theory, we respect that the Philippines does not recognize divorce, while other countries, especially Japan and the United States, allow divorce among their citizens. Having said that, let us now put on record that the Philippines has adopted some exceptions that the Philippines does not recognize divorce. Four of our countrymen, Filipinas of that, three of them married to Japanese uh, nationals, were given recognition of their divorce secured in a foreign country. Remember, under nationality theory, once a Filipina is married, that is her legal status. And since divorce is not recognized in the Philippines, once they got married, they will continue to be considered married uh, females, married Filipinas. And so in the case of uh, Juliet uh, Rendora Morales, a 2019 Supreme Court decided case. In the case of Rodora Racho and also Marilyn Manalo, both decided in 2018. The three ladies got married to their respective Japanese husbands, but subsequent events had them divorced from these husbands. And so at a certain point, Juliet, Rodora, and Marilyn are no longer married to their Japanese uh, husbands under Japanese law by reason of the divorce that was sought, either by them on their own or jointly with their Japanese husband or the Japanese husband alone. Here is a situation where, for example, Juliet, if we follow the nationality theory, would still be a married individual because once married, always married, because there is no divorce in the Philippines. And so here is a situation where Juliet is, is a married Filipina and her former Japanese husband is an unmarried Japanese husband insofar as Juliet is concerned. The same is true with Rodora. The same is true with Marilyn. The Supreme Court recognized, therefore, a situation that because of the strict adherence to the nationality theory, which recognizes no divorce, and because there is no divorce, they will all be considered married by way of their legal state status. Supreme Court said now that we will take an exception. That when a Filipina is married to an alien or a foreigner, and the uh, country of the alien granted a divorce, whether or not applied by the alien or applied by the Filipina or jointly applied by them, then the divorce in the foreign country recognizes that there is no more marriage among, between the two couples. 
Juliet with her Japanese ex-Japanese husband, Rodara with her ex-Japanese husband, and Marilyn with her ex-Japanese husband. Philippine courts rationalize that how can there be justice, fairness, and equity when a Filipina, because of the nationality theory, will forever be married to that Japanese ex-husband, while the Japanese ex-husband is free to remarry, and Juliet, Rodora, and Marlene are not free to marry. And so the Supreme Court said, when a foreign country, the country of the alien spouse, grants a divorce, and such a divorce decree is proven before Philippine courts, then the Filipina husband is also considered divorced from the foreign uh, husband. The case of an earlier Imelda Pilapil case is even more interesting in 1989. Imelda Pilapil got married in Germany to a German citizen by the surname of Gerling. After a while, Gerling uh, filed a divorce uh, uh, application before the German court and the German court granted the divorce decree of Imelda Pilapil. So Gerling, Imelda Pilapil, went home to the Philippines, of course carrying the status of still a married uh, uh, Filipina to Gerling under Philippine law. But Gerling, under his own German law, is no longer married to Imelda. Imelda undertook to live a normal life until Gerling, coming to the Philippines, sued her for adultery. Apparently, Imelda was involved with another man, not her husband, who is supposedly under Philippine law, Gerling. And so, therefore, Gerling now filed a case of adultery against Imelda Pilapi. The Supreme Court recognized the injustice because Imelda Pilapil can only commit adultery if she were the legal wife of Gerling. And so the Supreme Court said, you are no longer the wife of Gerling even when Philippine law does not recognize the German divorce. Because you cannot be married to a German spouse who is not married to you. So if he says he's not married to you, then you are not also married to him. So the case of adultery was dropped because Imelda Pilapil was not a married woman anymore. So this is one particular case where the nationality theory and the Lex Loci Celebrationis, meaning the documents that would show divorce as valid documents, run contrary to the nationality theory, but our Supreme Court in the four cases of Juliet, Rodora, Marilyn, and Imelda recognized these as exceptions to the no divorce decree in the Philippines. Another very interesting situation is the difference between Lex Loci Celebrationis and the nationality theory. In uh, the preparation of the last will and testament, Lex Loci Celebrationis recognizes verbal last wills and testaments, notably in Switzerland. On the other hand, the Philippines recognizes only written last wills and testaments. And so if that were to be followed, there will now be inconsistencies within a, uh, a last will and testament executed before a Swiss public notary uh, insofar as the verbal affidavit is concerned. And in land ownership, while other countries recognize foreigners to be capable, legally capable of owning land, in the Philippines, only Filipinos can own land. Another principle in Lex, in conflict of laws, is what is called Lex Situs. Lex Situs refers to real property as well as personal property being subject to the law of the country where it is stipulated.
On the other hand, resurrecting our nationality theory under Article 16, second paragraph, it says, interstate and testamentary succession, both with respect to the order of succession and to the amount of successional rights and to the intrinsic validity of testamentary provisions shall be regulated by the national law of the person whose succession is under consideration, whatever may be the nature of the property and regardless of the country wherein said property may be found. In effect, under the nationality theory, the person whose property is to be passed on upon death, donation, mortis causa, will be governed in whatever he can give up with by way of the order of succession, the success, amount of succession rights, and the municipality following the national law where he comes from. Bringing in now directly the issue of conflict of, conflict of laws, when a foreigner has properties, for example, in the Philippines somehow, and executes a last will and testament. His last will and testament should be followed by Philippine law under the nationality theory. However, if in the process, uh, uh, Philippine law requires that only uh, Filipinos can own land. And so if by any incidents that foreigner possesses land in the Philippines, would he be able to pass on that land to another foreigner, let's say his uh, relative, his, uh, say his, his uh, son, who is a foreigner, considering that the raw on real property in the Philippines is that only Filipinos can own real property. Let's take a look. The battle between nationality theory and Lex Aetis. Here, we put side by side the provisions of nationality theory versus Lex Aetis. And the nationality theory is what is already on the right side. It is good to put it side by side if only to show that it, say, the, the uh, Philippine Constitution says Save in, in cases of hereditary succession, no private land shall be transferred or conveyed except to individuals, corporations, or associations qualified to acquire or hold lands of the public domain. This particular Lex Saito says that only Filipinos can own land. Somewhere along the line, this, this, is now, uh, this may now contradict the nationality theory where, for example, a Filipino spouse should pass away. And under the nationality theory, her successional rights will allow her to pass on her property to anyone she wishes. Unfortunately, when that particular person is the surviving spouse who happens to be a foreigner, then the question would be, would that Filipina adhering to the nationality theory be able to pass on her land to her surviving spouse who is an alien? Let's revisit that. In the battle between nationality theory and Lex Aetis, it would be worthwhile to take a look at this. On the left side is Article 16, Paragraph 2, which says, The Philippine Conflicts Law gave a deceased person to give away the property, mortis causa, whether or not through a will. The family code is clear on both testate and instate succession as to the order of succession, the amount of successional rights, and the intrinsic validity of testamentary provision. So here, under the nationality theory, the family code recognizes that the deceased person, more so the Filipino, can pass on her property by reason of succession. However, more superior is the constitution which says 
that the Constitution limits the alien surviving spouse ownership of any inherited land received through interstate succession and not when a will was executed. Here, there is no distinction on whether or not a Filipino citizen can pass on property either by will or interstate. But in the Constitution, the alien surviving spouse of that Filipino can only uh, claim ownership if the transfer of land is through interstate succession and not when a will was executed. Very interesting. The Philippine Conflicts Law prevents the full implementation of the national theory, if you if you'll notice, in that the Filipino has no power to give as a gift to an alien surviving spouse by way of a last will and testament. Any distribution of a free portion in the will cannot exceed the alien spouse share with the succession being interstate. The Constitution, however, has provided the rare exception of an alien owning land in the Philippines received as a surviving spouse in an interstate proceedings. It is not, however, clear how the last will shall be equally treated when the ownership by the alien of the inherited land can only be via interstate succession. The Constitution also allowed another set of aliens to own land, the sick children of the deceased person who may not possess Filipino citizenship to own the land for reasons that they may be under dual citizenship considering the mother is Filipino. And so in the last will and testament itself, we again reiterate that the nationality theory respects Article 16, where the succession will be governed by the national law of the deceased person as to the order of succession, amount of successional rights, and intrinsic validity of testamentary provisions. Now, the Philippine Conflicts Law adheres to the nationality theory as we keep repeating, and so to illustrate, spouses Adan and Eva are Filipino citizens. And they executed, obviously, their last will and testament in Manila. And the validity of the intrinsic, extrinsic validity of that last will and testament is very easily by Lex Loci Celebrationis. And it is intrinsic. Intrinsic validity depends upon the family code. Obviously, because there are no foreigners involved, the law to be applied are, it would be Philippine law on Lex, Lex Rosae Celebrationis and the family code. However, let us take a look at a mixed marriage between an American husband and a Filipino and they executed a last will and testament in Manila. The question would be, how would, if it is the Filipino that passed away, what would be the guideline on the conflicts rule? He will you notice that the conflicts rule will only, there is no conflicts rule, even if there is an American citizen, because the subject matter of the uh, Succession is a Filipino citizen, meaning it is the Filipino uh, uh, law, Philippine law that will be followed. So, in the area of extrinsic validity of the will, it is lex resis liberationis, and in the intrinsic validity, it is the family code. So, the one that will be applied for Eva's uh, estate will be Philippine. We now move on to another major uh, topic under conflict of laws, the uh, so-called domiciliary theory 